So, I told you that I'd be talking about three arguments Hume gives, and I've told you about two of them already. Uh, those two arguments concerned the way that reason operates and why it can't affect the passions. Uh, I first told you about the argument that talked about the two things reason does and how uh, neither of those would affect the passions by or would directly motivate action. You'd need passion to uh, motivate action uh, uh, in either case. And then there was an argument that uh, reason itself couldn't affect the passions, uh, couldn't prevent actions, cause actions, eliminate passions, create passions, because it's just not set up right to do so. Uh, it doesn't itself uh, deal with things that can't be true or false, and the passions are the kinds of things that can't be true or false. So it can't create or destroy passions and affect action. Uh, those arguments started from, here is the way reason is, here's why it can't do this other thing. Uh, the third argument I'm going to give you is sort of of a different kind. Uh, it's an argument where Hume takes the data that support his opponent's view and says, actually, my view can explain that data more simply than your view can. Uh, what kind of data is it that support uh, the opponent's view? Well, let me uh, sort of uh, uh, give you... Uh, uh, the second half of this will be sort of mysterious right now, but I want to... Uh, 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 at least show you the first half. Um, here, his opponents uh, talk about these actions of the mind that uh, operate with calm, calmness and tranquility. And he says, you guys are mixing those up with reason. Um, and, and all of you who judge things from the first view and appearance are doing that. And uh, that's, I think, the kind of experience of action that gives support to his opponent's view. Uh, so sometimes you just feel uh, something very calm moving you that doesn't generate much emotion. And sometimes you feel some very strong temptation, like uh, you're really hungry and you want to eat something, and there's food right there, but it doesn't belong to you, and you don't steal it. Uh, you feel the thing that pushes you to eat the food more strongly than you feel your motivation not to steal it. So what's going on there? Uh, how can this be happening? Isn't this just reason getting you not to steal food? That's what Hume's opponents would say, and Hume has to explain that piece of data. Now, he could just say, you have a passion not to steal. But his opponents might come back at him and say, well, this passion doesn't really feel like a passion. It doesn't generate as much emotion as our passions typically do. We don't feel the urge not to steal in the same way we feel the urge to eat. So why is this really a passion? Shouldn't we say this is reason motivating us? And maybe, okay, Hume, you made all those arguments about reason, uh, 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 that reason uh, uh, only worked in these two ways, and it could only deal with things that could be true or false, but maybe we should just deny that premise of your argument and say, no, reason can deal with things like passions. It has a third thing it can do that generates... Uh, uh, motivation, and this has nothing to do with truth or falsity, but it's still something reason does. Well, why not say that? Uh, here's what Hume's response is going to be. Uh, well, look at the way the passions work. Sometimes the passions are really calm. When are they calm? Well, when we don't have vivid uh, representations of their objects. Uh, when we don't vividly imagine the objects of passion or sense it. So you can see this with hunger. Uh, suppose you are hungry for something uh, and uh, the food is right there in front of you. Then you feel your hunger really strongly if you can see the delicious food and see all the delicious aspects of it. Uh, but if you don't have the food uh, right there in front of you, uh, you might feel somewhat less hunger. Uh, and uh, the same goes for a lot of our other uh, uh, passion-based motivations. Uh, sexual lust is like this. It sort of rises to a greater height once you have a very attractive person in front of you. Uh, if that person isn't there, you don't feel it quite as strongly as you do when they're right there. Uh, so uh, it isn't even necessary that the, it isn't really necessary that the person actually be right there, though that's certainly a great case for it. Uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, some people who see this on YouTube will, uh, uh, at some other time while they're on the, the internet that day, see uh, vivid images on the internet of uh, attractive people uh, uh, and then feel their lust very strongly. Uh, vivid images in the senses or imagination 
uh, vivid representations do this to your passions. They make your passions more violent. What Hume wants to say is that uh, all our passions do this, and we can understand cases like being motivated not to steal, uh, being motivated uh, despite the fact that passion is very calm there, just as an instance of how things are when we don't have vivid representations of their objects. Now, if you saw somebody getting flogged painfully for stealing and saw them screaming out in pain uh, as you were thinking about whether to steal, then you might feel a, a, a very strongly felt motivation not to steal at that point. Uh, but uh, usually that's not what's happening. Usually you don't have such vivid representations, so the passion remains calm. What Hume is doing is trying to give a general explanation of how passion works. And uh, this general explanation is going to have the consequence that sometimes, when you have representations that aren't vivid, your passions remain calm. And that fits what's going on in the story of uh, you not eating the food that's not yours, even though you're hungry, because it would be stealing. And so the principle he's relying on that shows up in our reading is this principle about the imagination and the affections. As it goes, the imagination and the affections have close union together, and nothing which affects the former can be entirely different to the latter. When our ideas of good and evil uh, acquire a new vivacity, the passions become more violent and keep pace with the imagination in all its variations. So that's what's going on in these cases. Uh, there was an interesting story in our reading about the Greeks, and uh, here's what's going on in that story. It's sort of a chance for Hume to explain something interesting uh, using his story about the passions. Uh, so in this story, one of the Greeks, uh, Themistocles, gets this idea uh, that uh, they're going to... Uh, he, he thinks the Greeks should burn down all the ships of the enemy kingdom. Uh, of all these other Greek kingdoms uh, that are sitting in uh, a, a nearby port. And if they do that, then the Greeks will rule the sea. And so it, he can't really tell every, everybody this, uh, because if he does, word will get out, the other kingdoms will find out and sail away. Uh, so what he does is, uh, he tells everybody, I've got this great plan. If we follow it, it'll be great for us. And the other Greeks say, uh, well, uh, Okay, what is it? And he says, I can't tell you, it's a secret, but it'll be great for us. And the other Greeks say, okay, look, go tell Aristides, we trust him, and he'll report back to us on whether it's good or not, and we'll do what he says. So Th Themistocles tells Aristides his plan. Aristides comes back and says, uh, really, it'd be greatly to our advantage, but it'd be terribly unjust. And hearing that, the Athenians vote against it. Now, this historian who Hume likes uh, 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 but disagrees with on this uh, uh, point, Hume uh, says, uh, well, this historian says, wow, look how amazing the Greeks are. Uh, they decide to do the just thing and not the thing that'll give them advantage. They're pretty amazing. Uh, but Hume responds, you know, this isn't quite so amazing. They didn't have vivid representations of their advantage to think about. They just had it in the general terms of advantage. Now, if you, if, if, if uh, uh, Themistocles or if Aristides had come back and said, you guys will have all the delicious olives of the enemy kingdoms, and you'll be able to loot those kingdoms and steal their gold, well, then the Greeks would be able to think about gold and olives, and as they think about all those things that Greeks like, suddenly their passions would become more violent with vivid images of the things they really like, and then they might have voted the other way. So uh, Hume there thinks, you know, your explanation isn't the most impressive one. I think Hume's stuff about how vivid images excite violent passions explains a lot. It explains why we're often short-term thinkers, pursuing our near-term good rather than our long-term good. Uh, it explains a lot about how we think and feel and act. Uh, the philosopher of mind, Jerry Fodor, one of the uh, great philosophers of mind of our time, uh, says that Hume's treatise is the foundational document of cognitive science. Uh, it's sort of the document from which our picture of how the mind works really uh, began to be developed. Uh, and I think that's basically true. Uh, here is Hume long ago being one of the forerunners of modern psychology, trying to build a good psychological theory. Uh, it's an amazing book in that way. And this is what Hume's uh, last argument is, an attempt to give a psychological explanation 
of the data underlying his opponent's theory.